and we're live welcome back everybody to a new episode of the wheelie podcast i'm your host mike atoll and i'm joined again by electric seth weintraub how's it going seth good awesome and we've got another pile of interesting stories this week uh a bunch of e-bike stories but also it's been a big micro car week or two because we've got several stories there as well we've got um, a new e-bike drop from specialized uh, I recently took a trip to the Netherlands with Gazelle to see what biking around the Netherlands was like and what we can learn from that. Uh, we've got a review of a super weird folding e-bike. Luna dropped the price of their um, six and a half kilowatt Talaria triple X, which was pretty surprising. So we're going to go over that as well. And then we'll move into those micro cars with the Silence SO4 and the uh, Microlino, both having some uh, big news items. And then we'll finish it up with a sort of weird Alibaba brought to life story. So where are we starting this time, Seth? All right. Specialized just released a 36-pound electric mountain bike, but it's not for you. That's right. It's not for you. It's for your kids, actually. Um, actually, maybe your kids, Seth, or your younger one, perhaps. Uh, it's kind of like for the 6 to 12-ish age group. And the cool thing about this specialized e-bike is that compared to most kids e-bikes we've seen which are kind of like a cheap walmart bike with a hub motor this is actually a really good quality kids e-bike so it's got the exact same motor that the um, specialized levo sl has which is the adult version of their mountain bike it's got the exact same battery and a lot of the components are the same it's got that dropper post um, it's got similar hydraulic disc brakes a really nice uh, sram uh, shifter set so this is a high quality mountain bike. It's just an e-mountain bike for kids. And it's designed to, to help kids sort of get into that sport and keep up with maybe more advanced riders, keep up with their parents, or just be able to tackle those hill climbs that children might not yet have the leg strength. You know, they haven't built up the, the muscle stamina for some of those more um, arduous climbs that are in some of these more technical tracks. But they're already at the point where they're developing their mountain biking skills. So that's kind of the market that it's going for here. And I know sometimes when we talk about kids e-bikes, it can be a bit of a controversial subject. But in this case, this is a class one e-bike, which means there's no throttle. It doesn't go over 20 miles an hour or 32 kilometers per hour. So, I mean, in my mind, I see this as a pretty big win because it's, it's not taking anything away from kids. They still have to pedal. It's just allowing them to access some of these steeper, harder to climb mountain bike trails that they might not be able to under their own, you know, eight year old quads kind of thing. So uh, I'm pretty excited about this. Now it, it is expensive. I think it starts at something like $3,800. So, you know, this, it, it says specialized on the side and it has a, a specialized level price tag too. But if you're buying a bike for a kid that you, you want to last for several years, you know, they say this is for, um, I think somewhere between like four feet to five feet or something like that. So there's a pretty, you know, long age range there that a kid could use this then, you know, this is the type of bike that's going to last. It's not a, a disposable, um, you know, Walmart bike kind of thing. But uh, I'd be interested in your perspective, Seth, because I know you you have kids that do ride mountain bikes. So uh, uh, what do you think about this type of, of electric mountain bike for kids? Yeah, I mean, it, there's definitely a market for this. Um, I would say, like, not only for kids, uh, you mentioned four feet to five feet tall. Um, there's, there's some adults who aren't five feet, so... If if they're looking for a bike, maybe this is something they would want to consider. Um, obviously the price, um, is pretty high, so you gotta be pretty into it and have a pretty good, uh, stash of cash, uh, to want to, you know, invest in this because obviously your kids are going to grow out of it. Maybe you have, uh, you know, a couple kids that will cycle through this bike, but, um, it's good that somebody's making something like this. I think uh, there's definitely a market for it. Um, you know, for my kids, um, they, so one of the reasons you would get this is because you want your kids to keep up with you uh, on the mountain uh, bike trails. Um, my kids are already like as strong as me. So I'm like, eh, they don't need any help. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, I think they would, they would enjoy this. My kids are also like, you know, they're on the 20 inch uh, fat tire e-bikes when they're not on their, you know, regular size mountain bikes. So um, they're already on, you know, smaller adult size e-bikes, even at uh, 11, year, 11 years old as my youngest. Uh, him and his friends were just out riding the uh, 
one of the Himaways and uh, the the Scorpion X, uh, the Juice Scorpion X yesterday. So uh, they've already kind of outgrown the the smaller bikes. But I can see, I can definitely see this, especially in Europe, doing well for uh, parents who want to bring their kids out with them on the on the mountains. Yeah, I'll be interested to see how it sells because you know the if you don't look at the price tag then I love everything about the bike and I love the idea. It's just, you know, most people that are buying bikes for their kids aren't spending the kind of dollars you spend on your own personal adult bike. And Specialized is, you know, they're a great company, but they're not an affordable company by any means. You go to them when you want a, a long lasting, higher quality bike. So, you know, there's a lot of adults that wouldn't spend $3,800 on an e-bike for themselves, which is why you have so many budget options. So I, I love what they're doing here. I just hope that they can actually sell these because, uh, you know, I'd love to see the sport of electric mountain biking grow. And and for kids that, that want to be able to get into those tougher trails, I, I could see this as being a, a pretty cool option. Yeah, and the 24-inch wheels are, you know, a pretty standard size for uh, kids' mountain bikes. Um, so it's, you know, it fits kind of in, in the scene. But, you know, like you said, the price is going to be the big, big hill to to get over i guess let's move on here uh i went to the netherlands you did uh, with gazelle to see a biking paradise but found something more surprising yeah so i was in um a number of cities in the netherlands i was in amsterdam uh utrecht i think i'm hopefully getting that close to the right pronunciation and uh, uh Dieren, which is where gazelle's headquarters is and uh, they brought a bunch of journalists out on a trip to basically meet Dutch cycling culture. And so, you know, I thought I was going out there to basically like see Amsterdam and, and see why bikes have taken over and why there are so many bikes. But in actuality, what I really learned was that it's not just about getting people on bikes. It's really more about designing cities that make people want to bike because it's, you know, it's not really a chicken and egg scenario. It's like creating the right hen house that, that chickens want to lay eggs here. And so that was a really fascinating part about this because Amsterdam, you know, I think some people have seen those pictures from, you know, the 60s and 70s when basically cars ruled Amsterdam. You know, it wasn't always like it is today. And the government basically created a system that favored bikes. So, um, you know, they redesigned cities. They created roads that were either bike only or bike priority, which is interesting because you see a lot of these red uh, brick roads and red there is the the symbol that this is a bike road that have signs that say bike road cars are guests so cars are allowed to drive on some of these but like they're the secondary vehicle it's not like in the u.s where it's like you know bikes get to share the road there it's like cars are, are guests on the road yeah and uh, a lot of cities are designed so that you know there's a um sort of ring road or there's um you know larger arterial roads but then when you get into the city it's just less convenient to be with a car. You know, there's not as much parking. There are, um, you know, charges to get into the city. Uh, it's not navigable by, by, uh, by cars, whereas you have lots of streets that are only bike friendly. So they've basically designed these cities here to encourage this culture of cycling. Now, it's, it's important to keep in mind that, you know, cycling was always a part of the Dutch culture. It wasn't like in the 60s and 70s, they woke up and discovered bikes, you know, like, before World War II, people rode bikes all the time. And so you're starting with some basis here of, of a cycling culture, but they really designed these cities to encourage that. And in places like Amsterdam, I think the statistic was something like 70% of trips actually uh, are completed by bicycle. So the rest of that is made up, not just cars, but public transportation and other things. Uh, but interestingly, there's a lot of multimodal transportation. So, you know, you've got all these train stations that people will leave their bike at. Uh, some people even have multiple bikes. So they'll leave one at, you know, one train station and they'll keep another one at the other. So they sort of ride that one to and from work. And then they've got their home bike. Uh, there are actually more bikes in the Netherlands than there are people, which uh, leads to some interesting parking solutions as well, as we saw, where there are these massive parking garages with um, I think several of them were like between seven to, to 12,000 bikes in a parking garage, which sounds like it would be pretty big. And I mean, they look big when you're in them, but if you compare that to a parking lot for, you know, 10,000 cars, the parking garage for bikes is so much smaller and it, it fits in a city, which is really cool to see how many bikes you can get in a small area. So they've had to come up with these sort of 
um, you know, unique solutions to ensure that these cities are bikeable. But when they've put in the time, they've built the infrastructure, they've even created like here's a, a rural area or, you know, what would sort of be suburbia almost in the U.S. And here still, you know, people just cycle basically everywhere because they've they've invested in the infrastructure to put in cycling lanes or even cycling highways like this one out kind of in the the boonies of the Netherlands. But you can imagine it's a lot cheaper to lay down a bicycle highway like this than a four lane car highway. So it's, you know, I came to, to the Netherlands expecting to learn about bikes and how the Dutch cycle. And I, I left with a much deeper understanding that it's, it's not as much about the bikes as it is about building the cities that invite bikes. Yeah, the, uh, the one bike per person, you know, more than it reminds me of the one, more than one gun per person in the U.S., <laughs> Maybe maybe we can do some sort of like guns for bike program or something. A trade in, I would love that. Be kind of nice, right? Uh, Uh, Not likely. Not uh, you know, (laughs) uh, maybe in some states. I don't know. But uh, yeah, super cool to see this. I'm always like when I look at your footage, I'm always like freaked out by how nobody's wearing a helmet, and uh, it's just like uh, I guess like once once you're really just comfortable with that i guess there's not much need for a helmet or they don't go fast enough to need the helmet or what's what's your kind of take on that yeah it was interesting so i asked multiple people about that because i was so shocked i'm in the very pro helmet camp and for the dutch it's it's weirdly just like a non-issue like when you ask them why they don't wear helmets they kind of look at you confused as if they didn't realize it was an option because i i I think so i got multiple answers some people would say like it's just not necessary Like there's, you know, you're not riding around cars the way you are in the U.S. So the chances of getting hit by something are a lot lower. Um, It's also, I think, sort of an inconvenience to them because it's not like in the U.S. where like, you know, you get your gear on, you get your bike out, like cycling's a whole thing there. It's just how you leave the house. Like you just step out, you hop on your bike, you go. So that's the funny thing. Like anytime you see someone with a helmet, it's our group of journalists here. Okay. We even, uh, we rode past this, um, this mom in a uh, front loader cargo bike with two kids in the front going uphill. She was in a, a pedal cargo bike, by the way. So like, you know, way to go for her. But as we went by, um, the kids asked the mom, why are those people wearing helmets? Which are uh, one of our uh, gazelle like minders translated for us, which I thought was hilarious. That's funny. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of like the kids uh, walking around the mall uh wearing helmets because they have like seizures or whatever yeah. um it i wonder if that's like the vibe that it gives off there like there's you know these people are gonna fall and have a seizure and they need to uh, wear a helmet because of that yeah well it definitely like made us sort of the other which is probably good because i think the other cyclists gave us like a little more space in amsterdam where it's like you know known for being like super tight tons of bikes all riding together in like a big flock of of bikes so you know everyone saw us with their helmets and was like oh go around these tourists yeah and so you know I, i'm totally down like I, I i would totally love to live in a, a, a world like this but the part that i'm not great at uh is like when it's raining like you ha- like you, you talked about gearing up like you have to get like you know waterproof pants or do something with pants you you have like it just seems like it's a hard ask for to go out in a cold rainy day or, you know, a snowy day or something. It just seems like, but they do it right. Like on a cold, it looks like kind of cold day there. Yeah, for sure. I mean, in terms of like the cold and the rain, it doesn't seem to bother them as much. Like when it was sort of like drizzling, which it did a lot throughout the week, I saw people riding all over. Some people even ride with an umbrella above them, which Mm -hmm. is always kind of funny to see. Um, there was a hailstorm that came through and people were riding the fewer of them. Uh, but the other thing that's interesting is, uh, these not even micro cars, but I call them even like tiny micro cars are popular there that are like two seaters. And some people actually drive those, uh, they're allowed. There's one on the side of Mm -hmm. that red one there. And, um, I guess that sort of gives people a small, almost bicycle sized vehicle that you are protected from the rain and from the cold weather. Um, and so it's, that's, that's pretty common as well in Amsterdam, not as much in the rest of the country. I rarely saw them outside of Amsterdam, but, um, you know, there, there, there are just tons of them everywhere. All those little like mine, uh, mini micro cars. 
Yeah, so the speed limit there, uh, so I see the rain here. Uh, the speed limit is um, 15 miles per hour. Uh, what is it, 25 kilometers per hour? Yeah, I think in many places, I think it's 30 kilometers per hour, which is like 18. So it's probably okay. somewhere between like 15 to 18 miles per hour in the cities. Okay, well, that, I mean, that probably feels a little bit safer to go helmetless, but... Yeah, um, for sure. And, and there are deaths, you know, I think there was something like... 60 to 80 cycling deaths per year or something so i mean a lot of those people would probably still be alive if they wore a helmet i mean it sounds like you know kind of i don't know it's, it's not nice talking about these things but like you know i'm looking at these dutch people like just put on a helmet like it's not that hard right th this is their culture who am i who am i to tell them how to ride their bikes you know? right and they're obviously big bikers um <laughs> i mean you know 60 to 80 i i have a feeling like if everybody is in a car, that would be 60 to 80, at least 60 to 80 more car deaths. Um, so. Oh, absolutely. I don't, I don't think it's any more dangerous overall, but yeah, you're right. I mean, I'm sure some of those people wouldn't be dead if they had worn a helmet. I mean, I don't, you know, I don't know the statistics or whatever, but 60, 80 for a whole country doesn't seem like too bad a rate. Like obviously zero would be better, but um of how much how much they're driving um anything else like uh i mean obviously you know this is a pretty interesting experience from an american israeli perspective uh like you know were, were there any like easy fixes to uh u.s society i know tel aviv has tons of biking uh some places in the u.s do but you know the yeah it's uh, I, the whole time i was there i was trying to think all right so how do we like take this and bring it back and make it work. And the hardest part to that to me seems like the mentality because even the people who aren't into cycling in the Netherlands, like, so we had a driver throughout the week because we went to many different cities and sometimes uh, they took us in the, the, um, those new VW, uh, those are the ID buzz vans, but sometimes we're on the trains. So when they took mm -hmm. us in the vans, we had the same driver. And so I was talking to him about it and he was like, yeah, I don't really like cycling. Like I'm a car person. He's the only guy I met in all the Netherlands that said that. But he said, you know, like I only ride my bike basically when I'm out drinking. Um, and so I asked him, like, so what's it like when you get stuck behind all these bikes? You know, like when we're going through Amsterdam at like 12 miles an hour, like, is that frustrating to you? And he's like, no, I never really thought about it. I just like stay behind them. And so like even someone who's like a Netherlands version of a car nut, like the mentality is just totally different. Like he understands he's in a bicycle's territory. So that's the part that I just don't know how to bring that mentality to the U S and change the culture. I mean, I guess that's like infrastructure, right? You gotta somehow convince, uh, localities to, to make those changes to infrastructure, make it harder for cars to drive fast. I've seen like, you know, you make purposeful, uh, uh, you know, lots of t tight turns to make it hard to go faster through, you know, speed bumps, obviously, but, you know, way, ways for bikes to get around the speed bumps. Yeah. Traffic calming. I think they call that. Yeah. So yeah, no easy answers, I guess. All right. Uh, let's move on here. Uh, talk about the EUI K6 Pro. Is that just OI bike? E I bike? I have no idea. I, okay. I went with EUI, but I like OI. Yours is good too. OI. It's uh, Australian. Uh, why is this folding fat tire e-bike so weird looking? Yeah, so the short answer is that this bike is so weird looking because it has a super weird folding mechanism. Um, the whole middle of the bike there is like a big center axis hinge, whereas you normally have more like a door hinge type situation on most folding bikes. Like if you think, you know, electric XP 3.0, that type of bike has been sort of copy pasted everywhere. But this one is totally different. It's got that big chunky tubular hinge right in the middle so you get a whole different look to the bike which i kind of like seeing new you know innovative designs here in this case it's it's a bit of a clunky way to fold i'm not super excited about it and there's this weird sort of screw mechanism to unfold it that you'll see in a minute or so into this video but um otherwise you know I ignoring the the weirdness of the folding for now it's like a fairly generic um, moped style fat tire bike. It gets up to about 30 miles an hour or so. Um, 
it's got, you know, 20 inch fat tires, uh, seven or eight speed shifter. I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, hydraulic brakes includes rack and fenders. There's a lot of stuff that I like here. It's just, it's got such a weird folding system. That's like just kind of clunky and, and strange. So mm. I, I like that they thought outside of the box and they were like, Hey, let's like build something custom. Let's not just take parts out of a catalog. So, you know, like hats off to them for that and fitting it all into a full suspension design, mind you. But I'm not sure that the execution <laughs> is is quite uh all the way there you know it's especially with that sort of screw mechanism on the bottom of the bike that you gotta crank open and then tighten down it almost feels like you're like opening a fire hydrant or something hmm. it's just the whole thing is is too clunky to feel you know normal and safe to me if i was going to be using this as a folding bike every day yeah so its main differentiator is sub subpar to its uh to the so maybe not maybe not a winner but um certainly interesting yeah, if you aren't going to fold it that often, like you just want a fun, you know, neat looking full suspension bike with, with smaller fat tires, like it, you know, it works great. It's fast. It goes like 30 miles an hour. It's got, uh, I think it's a 15 amp hour battery. No, it's 20, I think. So it's got a pretty big battery in it. Um, but yeah, if, if you're looking for like a, a purpose folding bike that you're going to fold every day to like take on the subway, I'm not sure this is it. Yeah. And it looked like when you were folding, it looked pretty heavy as well. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, it's heavy. It's, it's awkward with that folding mechanism. The it's, it seems like a version one. Yep. All right. Uh, we'll keep an eye out for version two. Uh, all right. This is a fun thing. Um, so, uh, Luna's 6.5 kilowatt Telaria XXX goes on sale for a game changing 2995. Uh, yeah, so, I know you were telling us about this last week. So the the big news here is the price, right? Yeah, I mean it. It's really like it's it's a, at least a thousand dollars less than anything close to it. And you know, obviously, this is of the uh, Suron caliber type of uh, electric bikes, which is you know to say not quite a motorcycle, not quite an e bike, but somewhere in between. Um, you know, certainly you're not going to be uh, loved on any bike paths with this. <clears throat> and most, most police will probably not give you credit for riding an e-bike. Not that it's going to stop anyone, but, uh, you know, that, that class of Suron, which, which has existed for, you know, five, 10 years already. Um, but this comes in at a fraction of the price. So Suron will typically go for at about $4,500, and you can get those from Luna, I think, still. And then uh, Saran has an, a bunch of other. And I think you can even buy direct in the U.S. now. And I think, you know, reading between the lines, we don't have Eric here. Uh, we were hoping to have him here uh, this week. And maybe we'll have him in a week or so if we can pull him out of Vegas. Uh, but, uh, you know, the the, the Saran's $4,500. This is under $3,000. Um, it's, it's actually faster than a typical Saran. It's got a bigger battery than a typical Suron, and um, it's it comes with uh, street wheels, which is kind of curious because it's uh, you know labeled an off road bike. Um, Sounds like they know who's going to use it and how they're going to use it. Yeah, they they kind of read between the lines, and and taking that one step further, um, it comes with a uh, a speed limiter enabled, and you know the way you get to you know use it full power and it, and it has the full power motor of the bigger Telaria Telaria um Sting R uh but the battery output isn't quite as high and I think the controller isn't quite uh throwing the same amount of amps out so it's not quite as fast and a little bit smaller the wheels are 17 inch instead of 19 inch um but you know uh I the the way you get it to unlock is you cut a wire. I think it's called the brown wire and it's, you know, kind of like one of those wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Uh, and even like in the Facebook group, you see people going, Hey, this thing isn't really fast at all. It's kind of feels like something's wrong with it. And everybody's like, yeah, don't, don't, whatever you do, don't cut the brown wire. Like that is something <laughs> you do not want to do. Whatever you do, do not do that. You know, that it's kind of like one of those things. Is it actually a brown wire or is it called the brown wire? Cause like you need new underpants after you cut that <laughs> wire. Uh, I think it's both, but uh, 
yeah so i was lucky enough to uh ride a pre-production uh version of this when i was in la in april um not the black version it was like a you know just a generic uh talaria i don't know if it had so i i rode the talaria uh sting r which is crazy um that thing will go 55 miles per hour on a straight road um and I actually it got away from me, so I got a little scrapes on my knees and arms, like trying to run behind the bike as it was flying out from under me. <laughs> no. <laughs> but so after that, Eric let me ride this thing, and you know, in in all fairness, like this was much more my speed. Uh, and actually, um, there were two versions of this: one with the wire cut, one without. And you know, after having the bike come out from uh, the other one come out from under me. I was like, you know what? Give me the slow bike right now. I'm, you know, I'm still nursing my wounds here. And I actually really enjoyed the, the ride around in the, uh, the uh, pre Brown wire cut version of it. So you know, for some people that might be, you know, maybe, maybe you get it without the wire cut, but anyway, uh, incredible bike for this price, like 6.5, kilowatts on a 217 inch wheels enduro wheels you're looking at like close to 50 miles per hour um and you know for the price of like uh you know a track bike it's 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 kind of crazy that they can put this together yeah it's it's wild like it, it makes you wonder what this costs especially when you compare it to like replacement parts on an electric bicycle you know like there are probably some batteries out there that cost half of what this entire bike costs yeah, so this is um, what we're looking at on the screen is the um, European version. I mean, they're all coming from China, but um, there's a different importer in Europe, and they have a different version, which has a 17-inch rear wheel. It's called a, a mullet because it's something in the back and something in front, whatever. Yeah, uh, bigger wheel in the front. And the bigger wheels in the front. And I believe um, Luna will sell you an off-road package, include, but I don't know if the wheels... Like, I know the back wheel has to say 17, but I, I think the front wheel can go up to 19, like this one. Um, so if if you guys truly want to get one that's off-road, uh, you're going to need to do that. Um, I will say the ride, the suspension on these is phenomenal, like uh, lots of uh, room. Um, one of the downsides, though, is uh, if you're watching the video, uh, the only display, and this kind of goes for both Talarias. Um, is this really small uh, kind of like thumb uh, display that they have on the left. Um, it, it's fine for, you know, kilo, kilometers or miles per hour uh, and battery. Like those are the two things you're going to see. And those are the two most important things for a rider. But like, you know, if Surron owners are, are used to having a bigger display with more information about, you know, wattage output and, and such, um, for me, um, I have reading glasses like I'm wearing now, so I obviously don't want to wear reading glasses while I'm on, on a bike or have bifocals or, or, you know, whatever. So having a big display is something I, I would appreciate. Um, but you can see on the display as well, you have the down and up buttons that, um, you know, it's kind of the display and controller all in one. And I think that saves, uh, some money. So allows it to be a little bit less expensive. Um, there is a video, and I think a couple YouTubers have, I think Saronster and another YouTuber have gotten their hands on the Talaria, but um, it's it kind of reminds me a little bit of that, um, what was that little bike that you reviewed uh, that had that battery just like diagonal, like right through the bike? Oh, the uh, I think it was the Roadrunner Pro from Voro Motors. Yeah. So it kind of reminds me of that a little bit in that, Basically, the whole middle of the bike is a battery. Yeah, like a battery on wheels. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. So you know what I think um, would be interesting yeah. that brown wire, if you could cut it, but then splice it into a switch. So, like, if you let someone borrow your bike, you can sort of like unbrown wire it. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I think that that would be. I mean, you know, like, stop wink, wink, nudge, nudging everybody. Like, let's just sell it for what it is although i think they might have import issues on that yeah i think that's an import wire would be the better name for it right right um let's see the the motor i wanted to get the 
the battery spec on it. Um, this is the comparison between the Talaria and the the XXX and the uh, Sting R. Uh, it's obviously a little bit smaller all over. Oh yeah, they there will be a pedal kit. Um, it looks like a, a a little bit nicer than the the Suron kit, which is basically like a little sprocket and connected <laughs> to some pedals. Um, like double sided tape. <laughs> yeah, this one's going to be four hundred bucks. It looks like it's like actually connected to the frame, and uh, you might actually be able to pedal it a little bit. It's got quality in the name, quality pedal kit. Yep, can't contend with that. Let me do a fine for kilowatt hour. Oh. Yeah, it's a chunky looking battery. Yeah, it's something like three. There was two sizes in the European version, and I know uh, they went with the big one on both. All right, so it's 40 amp hours at, oh yeah, 2,400 watt hours, so 2.4 kilowatt hours. That's a huge battery. Sometimes a battery like that by itself will, will be $1,500. So the fact that this thing is three thousand dollars total, pretty impressive. Yeah, absolutely. And then also, I I like the fact that it's got regen braking, which I don't quite understand since it's uh, the motor's like on the chain. I don't. You have any any clue of how that will, uh, that could work? Um. Yeah. So it, it must be direct drive then, in that there's no freewheel between the. Um, basically the sprocket on the motor and the sprocket on the rear wheel. Anytime you let off the throttle, it's mm -hmm. going to back drive the motor. So you can't really coast. I mean, you can, it's just, you get like the, the lugging of the motor and that's where the regen comes in. Okay. Yeah. I wonder if, so you're, you're basically, your chain would be pulling, um, as even when you're not, uh, th on the throttle. That's yeah. Like exactly. Like right when you let off the throttle, suddenly your motor's spinning only because the rear wheel is spinning. Yeah, well, I have to do more investigation into that. We hope to have a Talaria uh, pretty soon here. Um, we're kind of, you know, counting the days, but uh, we know <laughs> that they're they're out of stock right now, so they're hard to come by. All right, moving on. Let's go to the Silence SO4 electric microcar with swappable batteries starts production. Yeah, I wasn't sure this was ever actually going to happen. So I'm very excited to see that this car has uh, made it out of conceptual stage and they're actually producing these things. This is a European microcar, uh, more accurately described as a quadricycle under European laws. So it fits in the L7E category. And it's built by a scooter company called Silence. They're based out of Barcelona. And they've got what I think is the coolest electric uh, like personal electric vehicle battery in the world. It's a uh, something like five kilowatt hour battery. So it's quite large, but it's still removable. And the way they can get away with having like a 50 or 55 pound removable battery is that it's got built in wheels and a handle that pops up like a trolley or like a, you know, carry on um, rolly bag for, uh, for airline travel. And so when you slide it out of the scooter, or in this case, when you slide two of them out of the micro car, wheels pop down just like on a hospital gurney that would slide into an ambulance. And now you roll it behind you like a, like a rolly cart. And so it's a really cool idea to give apartment dwellers a much bigger battery without having to carry, you know, like 50 pounds of battery up to their apartment. Uh, only one of them is necessary for a scooter, but for a car, obviously, you know, it's, it's significantly heavier. So they've got two of them. One goes in either side and uh, that way they can use the exact same batteries across all of the different scooters and this new electric micro car. Uh, it's a two seater. So, you know, it's still quite small. It's, uh, you're sitting side by side, so it's not going to be as small as a motorbike, but interestingly, it's kind of offset seating. So your uh, passenger isn't right next to you. They're actually next to you and a little bit behind you. And that gives them a little more uh, leg room. It cuts into the storage in the back a little bit, but they say you've still got room for two people's luggage. I think that's probably carry on luggage, not like checked bag luggage. Um, but all in all, like it's a really cool design for an electric micro car. And I just love the way that it's, I, I think it's one of the first removable battery micro cars I've seen in that, you know, you don't need a garage to charge this thing. You can 
just roll the batteries up to your apartment. Or uh, I think in Barcelona, they're going to try and do a, uh, a swapping station system as well. So kind of like Gogoro, you can um, subscribe to the car or I guess to the batteries. You buy the car, you don't buy the batteries, you subscribe to those and then you get a cheaper price and you just swap batteries whenever you need to. So a pretty cool system and a pretty slickly designed micro car, especially considering it came from a scooter company. Yeah, and so are the batteries uh, swappable with the scooter batteries? Yeah, they're the exact same batteries. Interesting. So you get two of them, and how big are they? Kilowatt. I think they're hour? about five kilowatt hours, if I'm not mistaken. Okay. So each one, so it would be a ten kilowatt total. Yeah. That's pretty good. Uh, and what kind of range does that get you? Uh, it's a good question. I don't recall off the top of my head. Um, think it was somewhere these are usually in the like close to 100 kilometer range so um you know 60 70 miles um i don't recall for this one um or if they even announced it yet but you know these are obviously city vehicles i think the l7e category is permitted to go up to uh, 90 kilometers an hour which is 55 or 56 miles an hour but you know, anytime you take a vehicle to like its maximum, you're going to be using way, way more energy. So, yeah. you know, th these are really designed for city use. And if you can get, you know, 60 miles of range, that's, I mean, how many days worth of city travel? Yeah, that's cool. And I noticed the, uh, like putting the battery in is like, did they show the process of that? Is it, you know, just kind of sliding it in or how, how does that work? Yeah, so I, I don't think I've seen it done on the, the car here. I've seen it done um, on the scooters, and it's super easy. I mean, it, it takes like three seconds. You literally oh, wow. just slide it into the side. The wheels automatically lift up as you slide it into the scooter, just like a like a ambulance gurney. So they've got a, a really nicely designed system. And same thing, when you pull the battery out, it just pops out the side, and the wheels drop down as part of the process. Yeah, I wonder if there's like a, a mass market like possibility for these like uh you know if you needed an extra five or ten miles you know on your tesla or like any other ev that you could just slide a battery into it and get get that range it would be nice if like tow trucks could just have one of these on board i mean i guess it's not that hard to throw a charge on onto you know other people's batteries but this just seems like it would be super easy to to throw around and then you know, the idea of like modular battery packs, like, Hey, you're towing it, towing a, uh, you know, a boat to the river. You need an extra 20 kilowatts. You could just roll in, roll up a couple of these. Yeah. Or when you're in the city and you don't want the extra weight penalty, you take a few out. Right. Yeah. 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 Uh, maybe, maybe we'll see more of these. I hope so. All right, uh, moving on to Microlinio, uh, celebrating its 1,000th adorable electric mini car, rolling off the line. Yes, yeah, so I've been following this one for years. Uh, the Microlino is a Swiss micro car, uh, same category. It's an L70 quadricycle, so it gets up about um, like 55 or so miles an hour. And uh, this one is based on like a similar design to the BMW Izetta, if you're familiar with that classic car. So it's just got a front door there's no side doors the whole front of the car opens up like a clam kind of and you climb in the front it's odd looking but i actually got the chance to get in one and drive it around the parking lot last week at um the micro mobility europe show which um, i'm working on that video now that'll be up next week but it works quite well and uh, interestingly they've designed it very much like typical automotive construction you can see the uh unibody chassis there so you know, these are not required to be built like cars. The quadricycle category is kind of like LSVs in the U.S., though they're allowed higher power and, and faster speeds. But the whole point is that there's fewer regulations for these vehicles so that, you know, they don't have to go, go through all the regulatory hurdles of a real car. But they, they still went through many of them to build a, a, a much safer, much more refined vehicle here. And so to already have reached their thousandth car is a big milestone you know there there haven't been that many new car companies in the last you know several decades and of those many fewer have made it to a thousand cars before failing so this is a, an impressive milestone for a new automotive company and uh, i'm really excited about it not the least of which because it is just so 
adorable looking. And I like the, the first time I saw this thing, I just fell in love with the look of it. So uh, I'm hoping to get in one of these for a longer test ride soon. I only did a few minutes in a parking lot, but I already you know fell in love with this thing. So I got to take it out in the city and have some real fun in it. Uh, yeah. And so where are these available? They're in several uh, countries in Europe. They're in um, uh, Switzerland, Italy, Netherlands, I think Germany, but don't quote me on that. Maybe if any Germans are watching, they can pop it in the comments or anyone who knows, um, let us know. But they're, they're quickly expanding the, um, uh, the list of countries that they're in. I can't imagine they'll come to the U.S. for a while, if ever. But of the uh, European quadricycles, they're, they're certainly um, expanding quickly, I would say. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, top speed of 90 kilometers per hour, which is 56 miles per hour on a 12.5 kilowatt motor. Uh, that That's impressive. Uh, we were just talking about the Telaria bike having a 6.5 kilowatt motor. So double that similar speed, obviously uh, more to carry around. But um, yeah, it looks looks super cool. Uh, I think they would be popular in the US, but of course, only in very, very uh, urban environments. Yeah. But like in New York city, like you could take this everywhere. Right. Like this would be like a great couple's car. Like if you don't have kids, right. This would be like the car. Yeah. And you know, theoretically get, keep the rain off of you and snow off of you. I think that would be appreciated. Um, yeah. I I feel like... just... sorry, go on. I was just riding, uh, in the bike lane in New York yesterday and um somebody was riding a bike but it had like a tent over it and it kind of looked a little bit like this yeah uh, for sure not I as mean, wide but uh it, it just had that like italian small car vibe yeah so. well that's like to me one of the biggest advantages of micro cars and like that's the pitch that i try to make is like so many people say well you know i just can't switch to a bike all right i get it there are a lot of people that don't want to ride a bike don't have the, you know, the muscle or whatever. You don't have, you don't want to be, you know, in the rain, get a tiny car. Like you don't need such a big car. People get something like this. If you don't want to ride a bike as a pedestrian, which a lot of the things that, you know, we think about um, car safety, we think about it as the people inside the car, but I think we need to think about people outside the car as well as a pedestrian. If I get hit by this, like I'm a lot less annoyed than if I get hit by, you know, like something that's not going to, and nearly as well like this you just kind of bounce off of and it's almost kind of cute yeah i agree uh, i was in the city to to go to rivian so i can't really talk that well about it uh small cars but because <laughs> you were in a seven thousand pound truck <laughs> exactly yeah <laughs> all right and finally uh this guy bought a wild standing electric atv from china here's what showed up and i have to say initially i thought this was uh the, the vehicle that fred got yeah so i think we're all going to get to see something very cool um from fred that, that's similar to this uh but this one is in fact not fred this is a guy named hector who uh <laughs> follows my awesomely weird alibaba electric vehicle of the week column i covered this thing a while ago and not only did he like it from that, but he saw another one of my readers also bought it. So he decided he was going to take a risk and uh, plunk down what turned out to be about $6,000 to get a standing electric ATV. And if you're wondering what a standing ATV is, imagine like a oversized electric skateboard with full suspension and a set of handlebars. And that's basically what you've got. Like a, a, monst like a monster truck meets skateboard is sort of the way I would describe this thing if you're not fortunate enough to be watching the, the video stream here with us. Uh, it's got what look like um, almost UTV tires uh, and is a surprisingly large vehicle. Um, in this case, it's uh, $4,000 is the, the price of the whole thing. Um, Hector added a bunch of accessories that came out to be like another 500 bucks or so, including like a rear rack, a um, uh, uh, like beacon light, uh, a few other utility things. And then he did what's called um, uh, DDP shipping, which is uh, delivered duty paid, I believe it stands for. And this is a less common form of international freight and importing, but it worked out really well for Hector because what that means is that 
Um, once he pays shipping to the Chinese factory, that's it. Theoretically, it comes to his door without him having to do anything. He doesn't have to do customs. He doesn't have to pay any other like fees or ransom along the way. Everything is the responsibility of the shipper. Uh, and so most of the time, <laughs> the Chinese factories don't want to do uh, DDP shipping. I have rarely had any agree to do this, but this factory did. And uh, so all in all, he ended up paying about $6,000 with that uh, freight and tax and everything else. And amazingly, it actually worked. The thing came on a container ship to California. It was unloaded. It was put on a truck, sent to Hector's driveway in Kentucky, and he never had to pay another cent. So the 6000 or something bucks he paid in the beginning covered everything. And I don't know how that's possible because... First of all, just the taxes alone should have been more than the 1200 bucks or so in shipping because this would have been under the 25% Trump tariff. So right there, you've got um, another $1,000 plus all the other customs charges. So I think someone screwed up somewhere. Probably the, uh, the uh, company or the forwarder they used didn't accurately calculate what customs was going to cost. But amazingly, they didn't charge him again because he was already locked in under the DDP terms. So he I got think the off term you're looking for is smuggler. <laughs> <laughs> there you go the, uh, the importer is not the right term <laughs> the smuggler got it through for a lot cheaper so uh it worked out great for him but i always advise on these things not to try this yourself i've unfortunately unfortunately heard of um sad stories of people that tried to import similar things or people that tried to import the mini truck that i got that kind of started this and it was stopped by customs and border patrol and not let into the country for any number of reasons. So that's only one way this whole song and dance can go wrong. And it's in fact, one of the last ways, like if it gets to the U S you've already achieved uh, a number of hurdle crossings. So it's fun to cover these things and to follow people that go on these adventures. And if you follow my stories, I often do this myself, but it's a big risk and it's, uh, it's not advisable unless you basically understand that when you pay that money in the beginning, it might just disappear and you're sort of okay with that level of risk. So don't go buy one of these because Micah said it's going to work out and you'll get it through with whatever smuggler this company used. Yeah. I, I am still too scared to take a plunge on a lot of these and like a lot of these look super cool, but none has tempted me to part ways with money yet. Yeah. I probably have undeserved confidence from the, several that went well for me, but that doesn't mean they will all go well. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to the comments. Uh, we got quite a bit today, but uh, if you do have anything that you want us to address, uh, please uh, put it in the system now. And this is a good time to tell you to uh, like and subscribe uh, if you're watching on YouTube or uh, give us thumbs up and five-star reviews. Those always help the algorithm. And, of course, tell your friends about us uh, if they're into e-bikes or weird little four-wheel four vehicles. Um, all right, Carl in San Diego. Uh, always great to hear from Carl. Uh, he just watched Bjorn cover. I'm thinking uh, Bjorn Nyland cover a quadricycle that he said is great for 15-year-olds. Seeing kids' bikes reminds me that temporary vehicles will need to be handed down a lot to be sustainable. Um, and that's in reference to the specialized uh, kids bike we covered. Um, I actually, uh, during the show, I was looking at, on Bjorn's channel. I didn't see it, but uh, that, that does make a lot of sense. Um, he also has high praise for your Netherlands coverage. And uh, same here. That was a fascinating uh, video. So oh, if, you haven't, you if you haven't watched it, uh, I think it was on the top of Electric for a while. Uh, go go search uh netherlands and electric and and watch that video uh carl continues dutch are combating the beater bike at the train station scenario with a national bike rental program instead for the last mile i know they had one in the past is that still going on yes yeah, so that's a great point and something i didn't actually address in the video um the like national train system or, or whatever it's called has their own bike rental system so you can basically take the train and it comes with a bike package deal kind of thing, which is perfect for someone who doesn't want to leave 
their bike in the city, but they live out in the suburbs. And so it, it works really well and you see them everywhere. They're blue and yellow bikes. And it's, you know, like first I thought it was like a tour group or something because I saw them in so many places. But then I learned it's, it's the like uh, train system zone bike share. That's cool. Yeah. What, what haven't they figured out over there? <laughs> All right. Uh, Devandra Gandhi says, nice to understand about the culture for me since I'm doing my doctorate in sustainable future mobility. Nice. All right. Uh, Anthony Layton says, are bikes considered equal to non e-bikes in the Netherlands? Not sure what that means. Oh, are e-bikes considered equal to non e-bikes? Oh, okay. um, yeah, I mean, the, the sense that I got was there's so many people using pedal bikes because they're just more fit and used to it. And e-bikes are still a little too, more. Right? Yeah, exactly. So e-bikes are still a little more for o- older folks, but you see a lot of young people still using e-bikes. So I think they're starting to permeate more into the general population. But also a lot of people treat their bikes pretty cavalier, and, you know, throw them around and stuff. So I think for that reason, a lot of people stick with sort of beater pedal bikes. All right, rain cape is a solution. I think that's in regard to my comment that it's hard to get out in the rain. Uh, yeah, I got to I got to get my bike situation winterized and and rain rainized, I guess. Uh, Tom Jacobs, even insurance companies here, I'm assuming he's uh, talking about uh, the Netherlands, advise not to use helmets or make it mandatory. The fact that you're wearing one. You get overconfident and less aware of your surrounding. I believe that is called the rugby versus football situation where rugby is a lot rougher of a sport, but they don't wear helmets and they have way fewer injuries. Mm, Interesting. I don't know if that's been scientifically proven. Just a bunch of drunk guys talking about. Anyway, (laughs) uh, Carl San Diego's back. The cycling deaths in Netherlands are actually biased towards elderly riders. Uh, You go out with your normal cycling transportation. I wonder what he means by that. Is it just like people die of heart attacks on bikes or. Yeah. Or perhaps like once you get older, you know, motor skills aren't as good or reaction time isn't as good. So that, that might be part of it. Bones are a little bit more brittle. There you go. Uh, And plus you're on an e-bike and you're going really fast. I don't know. Uh, Tom Jacobs, what you call class one. Yes. But with max speed of 25 kilometers per hour and no throttle button. Okay, so uh, it's that's in reference to the bike first non e bike. Yeah. Men- mentality and laws. What USA is overlooking is that bikes are considered not at fault in accident, as a car need to prove bike was in wrong and you could not anticipate. I think that's in re- reference to the safety of bikes and uh, you know the the idea that we can re- replicate the the Netherlands system. All right. Uh, so moving on to the, uh, we were talking about the uh, Talaria XXX. Wouldn't a bigger wheel in the back be called a mullet? I get, I get, I get the joke. I guess sort of uh, party in the front. No, business, business in front. up front, party in party the back. In the, yeah. yeah, so technically it's the other way around, but yeah, it would make more sense. Longer hair in the back. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I love my mini display from Egg Rider. Super stealthy, hard to read, but. Don't usually read it during the ride. Occasionally check range. So the Egg Rider is the name of that little display on the Talaria. Yeah. Uh, I understand that. And uh, I think for some riding uh, where I'm not really you know, worried about the speed, uh, that would make a lot of sense, especially since it's integrated into the controls. But for this particular vehicle, like you're on... Uh, you know, in the, in this case, you're on city streets going, you know, in the 40s. You kind of want to keep it down. Uh, I think in this use case, some more bigger information would be useful. And and I'm assuming Carl probably doesn't have a, a farsightedness like I do. So, all right, moving on. I uh, love the microlinear design. It should be reasonable to drive these rurally, too. We just need to rethink speed a bit. I mean, these they go 55 miles per hour, right? Yeah, as long as they're like, you know, rural highways, not like interstates. Yeah, you don't want to be on an interstate with this. Uh, we should resist the urge to category small cars only for cities. Average commute is 40 miles, and these do 50 miles per hour. Fair yeah, enough. That's a good point. We often fall into the small cars for cities traps, but I think all cars should be smaller. All right. Uh, Fred Carm. 
Karma, click that like button, guys. And then Justin Earhart, still struggling for good. Electric crowd in Detroit, wonder why. Uh, yes, Detroit is not built for uh, bikes of any sort. And that's probably not going to change. Unfortunately. Yeah. Oh, well. well. I think that's it for all of our comments. Yep. So uh, we want to thank you all for tuning in. We'll be back again two weeks from now with our next episode of the Wheelie Podcast. See you next time, everyone.